Good day guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. For those of you that don't know me already, my name is Daniel Pino and I am a longtime Access MVP. Today a subject that is um, quite common. People wanting to know when they have problems uh, and they're trying to figure out who's currently in the system because as we all know, as long as there's one user in the system, you can't basically do development you can't do a compact and repair and try to fix problems so with access it's a little bit more complicated or can be um, to identify who may currently have the database in use and locked and um, I figured today we'd go over um, a simple technique that I've used for well decades now um, and it's so simple and yet it works beautifully so I have an article, as you can see on the screen right now, you can go and peruse it to your uh, leisure. And you'll see at the very top, I give a couple links to other uh, threads and articles on it. You can indeed look at the Microsoft Jet user roster, okay? At that moment in time to see the status and see who's possibly logged in and things like that. And people have built some nifty utilities off of that. I prefer instead to use my approach. What is my approach? It's very simple. I create a table and when someone opens the database, it logs the fact that you've entered the database. And when you exit, it then also updates that entry to indicate that you've exited. Why do I prefer this? First of all, it puts me in control rather than relying on whatever else things in the background that are hidden and that are basically most people aren't even aware of. The other fact is it gives me historical values. So I can look and it helps me identify uh, users that don't exit the database properly. And these are the ones that potentially can corrupt the database. And I'll say firsthand, I have used this in several clients where we were having issues and by identifying the culprits and dealing with it, the issues went away of corruption completely. So it can be extremely useful for that. It also gives me the ability to build queries and forms upon a table, obviously like everything else in reports and extract data as I see fit. So you can, if you wanna be big brother, you can see who's been going in for how long, etc. And it gives me the ability, when I need to, to instantaneously identify who is in the system. So how is it done? Well, I give a, a brief overview here. You can go through it. As you can see, it's very simple. Four steps. Create a table, create a form, set it up that it's going to work with the uh, startup or auto exec macro. And that's it. It is so simple to do. Now let's look at it in practice. So I have this demo database here. Um, let's just reopen it for a second. I'm gonna be using this for the next uh, video as well, because um, I'm gonna be demonstrating um, another thing that has to do with identifying the users. But for today, we're concentrating on login tracking. So you're going to see here what interests us today is we're going to have a table to store the information. We're going to use a form and we'll see why after that, but I need it for the following step. And then we're going to have to use the auto exec because this is what's going to trigger everything at the start of the database. And then I have some modules. Um, you're going to see this demo. I've tried to put in place some best practices. So I'm using self-healing object variables. If you're not aware of what that is, you should. And I will give you a link to my article video on that subject. From a performance standpoint, it's something you should be implementing if you haven't already done so. So what do we have? The beginning of all of this is we need a table to store the comings and goings of users. So that's what this is here. Now, I prefix my tables that are database admin stuff. Um, so for me, not for the users, I'll always prefix them with DB or admin or utility, something to try to group them all together and keep them, I mean, make them really stand out from the real tables that drive user forms and reports. 
but the name of the table truly isn't important, and nor are the names of the fields that we're going to look at in just two seconds. So this is what I've named it, but it really doesn't make a difference at the end of the day. So you can name it whatever works for your system. Let's look at the design of the table itself. Um, so I just have an auto number, so uh, user tracking entry ID. Uh, then I have a field here, which user, so the user ID of the person that just opened the database, uh, the computer name, the computer IP. Um, you know, these technically are optional. I use, right now, I'm only using the computer name. I'm not even using the computer IP, although I have in the past. But just these two are optional. They're extra information. And you could add more fields if you need more information. But what we're critical is you need the user ID and then you need to track their entry and their exit. So their login, their log off. You can once again, like I said, rename these fields however you see fit. The name has no impact. Obviously, you'll need to update one or two places, um, specifically in the code, and I'll show you where in just one second. But all of this is 100% customizable. The other thing, if you don't want to create this table manually, if you go back to that article that I initially showed you, you can just run this SQL statement and it will generate a similar table that you can then customize. So this would just save you a few manual operations. So we've got a table. Next thing is we need to build a form off of that table. The easiest way to do that is just do create and create a form based off of it. And at the end of the day, this is what I ended up doing. So it's just the same fields from the table that appear here. Now, we have this form that we're going to use for logging the comings and goings. I don't want to have to input data. I don't want users even touching this form because then people could mess around with things. So we want to auto automate as much as possible entering the data. So how do we do that? Well, if we come over here and look at the events for a second, you're gonna see I've got three. I've got the load, the close, and the unload. So how is this working? Let's look at the load. So when this form is initially launched and loaded, what am I doing? I'm using it to populate the user ID, the computer name, the DB entry value. Notice we're not putting the DB exit. Why? Because they haven't left the system yet. So it's too early to do that. And the last thing I'm doing here is a me dirty equals false, which actively saves this. So it creates the entry in the table immediately. So now we've got logged the fact that someone opened the form, opened the database. We'll see how in a second. And then if we look at the unload, so when they actually close that form, then I'm going to go put the me DB exit now. That's when we're populating the fact that they're exiting the system. The form close, I also use it to clear a variable, okay? And that is a self-healing object variable. Um, let's look at all of this now, these different functions. As you can see here, I'm using get user ID, get username, get computer name. What is all of this? Well, these are functions I've created and I have articles on my website, but that is exactly that, get computer name. Let's take a look. If we're in the immediate window, what will that generate? Oh, the name of my computer. Okay. If we do get username, what does that give me? Gives me Daniel. So that's my username on my system right now. So it is accurate. What does get user ID then do? Well, let's take a look. Oh, it brings back a value of one. And just so you understand where that's coming from, I have a table called users. And in that table, I have user ID of one, which is equivalent to the username of Daniel, which we just saw is my user ID. So it's cross-referencing textual values to return a simple numeric because I store here a numeric value, not repeatedly textual values. It's not the best thing to do as much as possible. Even computer name, technically, maybe we should be creating a lookup table, populating it dynamically and only storing numbers here. Uh, debatable. So as you see, I have a table for my database where I have an entry for every user. Now let's look at the functions themselves. How did I do all of this? Um, so I have a module PC info. That's where I have these functions. Get computer name. 
you're going to see here I'm using a static variable. So one that doesn't get wiped when the function is run. It stays in memory. Therefore, I'm able to run this and check if it already has a value to only execute this command, only go and do this once in the entire life of the session of this database for this user. So this is just a performance thing. And this is where self-healing variables, static variables come in handy and can just help reduce the load that you're applying to the computer. Hey, this isn't a complicated thing. Let's be serious. It's a simple call to get a computer name. But if you're doing a computer name, you're doing a username, you're doing a this, you're doing that over and over and over, you're taxing the system for no reason. So this is just a smart way of going about it. Send it only executes that command once, populates the value, and I've got it. And the next thing you come and run it, it's not going to execute this anymore because it has a static value. It's still in memory, so it can skip over this and just return it right away. So it's just a way of reducing and improving performance overall. Similarly, it's the exact same thing, but for here, we're going to do, we're getting the username instead of the computer name. Now I know you're asking me, what is this OWSH network thing? That's a self-healing object variable. I'm storing that in a separate module. It could just as easily have been here, but just to keep things distinct, I have another module here and this is on my website copied verbatim um, and it allows early or late binding depending on what you prefer i always use late binding so early binding is false i'm using late binding so it's using these declarations and you'll see here what it is at the end of the day it's going to go and execute this it's going to execute create object w script network but it's going to do it in an intelligent way that it's only done once so what does that mean? If we come back to this guy here, it means that if I ran, like I did here, computer name, computer name will initialize this. So it's going to come here and run this once. And yes, it's going to have to do the create object, which we all know is intensive uh, on the system. Create objects, you know, it's about the worst thing you can do in the grand scheme of things. Let's be serious with, you know, modern technology. It isn't that bad but it still is like one of the worst things that you can ask a computer to do. It's intensive on it. But now I came down here and then I did a get username. So I came down this guy and I ran it. Well, because this had already been initialized by my previous command, now it would come here and it won't need to run it because it's going to see that it's already populated. So it's going to skip over all of this and just return it right away in a similar way that I'm using the static variable here. So because we initialized it here, it didn't need to get rerun. It's already there in memory. So it's that much faster. And there it goes and it gives us our value. And then the get user ID, well, the get user returns the textual value of the username of the currently logged in person. And I can show you that if I just launch um, the um, command prompt for a second, if you're not familiar with some of this stuff, if you open the command prompt and you just type in set, you're going to get all the variables that are currently defined. And if you come up here, you'll see computer name. Okay. You'll also see username. All of these you can query using the exact same technique that I use for username. So it's going to return this string value of Daniel. Sorry, Daniel. But like I said, in my table, I'm not storing a textual value. So I need to convert that over to the ID by looking it up in the user table. And that's what this other get user ID function is. It's going to take the textual value and it's going to perform a D lookup on it. So it's going to look in the users table. It's going to return the user ID column value and the filter I'm using, the, you know, the where, is I want it to be equal, the username has to equal whatever I'm passing to it. And if you look at the function, what am I passing it to it? I'm passing it my other function, get username, which we already saw returns the username. So at the end of the day, this is simply taking the textual value and converting it over to the numeric one that's in the table. So I'm storing just a simple uh, long value rather than a string text value. 
So those are my three functions. Uh, they're very simple. I know that it looks a little bit more complex than it truly is. A lot of this is just error handlers because, you know, I always say it, you should have error handlers throughout. And then uh, that's it. So now you understand how this is all being populated, how they, the functions work. So it's taking my textual, returning it here, converting it over to number for the user ID, the computer name, while well, right now I'm storing it as text, it's entering now. So the current date timestamp is the DB entry. And when the form is closed, does the same, but for the exit. Glorious. So now we've got a form that when it's opened, creates an entry and when it's closed, it populates that last missing field. So we're happy. The last thing we need to do for all of this to work beautifully is, well, now we need this form to automatically open when the database is opened and we need it to close when the database is closed. Well, we're lucky that the latter is automatic. Okay, if we have a form open and the database is closed, that form automatically gets closed. So we don't need to worry about the closing aspect, but the opening we do. And the way I typically go about it is quite simply is I use the auto exec macro. Now, if you're not familiar with the auto exec macro, it is a macro that runs whenever a database is launched initially. So automatically execute. And what I do, if you come here and you look at the macro, go in design view, all I'm doing is I'm using a run code action and the function in this, once again, this is what I've used. You can name it however you'd like, but I made it so it's equal to your function name. So my function name is startup. I, I do that on purpose. So the macro simply runs a VBA function. What is that VBA function? The simplest thing you've ever seen. Once again, to keep things properly separated and easy to find, I have a separate module for that. So mod auto exec. And here you will see my public function. It has to be public function startup that we call. And what is it? This is the place where normally you might relink your tables. You might uh, do authentication verifications. You may do all sorts of other things. But when your database is set to actually go, you know, you finish all your initializations and things like that. The next thing I do is I do an open form of our DB user login tracking and I use the parameter hidden. So the form opens, but no one can see it. So no one can mess with it. No one even knows it's there. And that's it it now automatically opens when the database is opened. And when the database is closed, then it runs that last little tidbit here to put the exit date time and closes. So we get everything we need from the system. Let's look at this in action. So all I have to do to make this run is perform a compact and repair. In unbeknownst to you, that form is currently open, but hidden. We don't see it. How can I prove it? If I open my table, you'll see here that I have an entry at 925. We're 925. And you'll see here a historic of different entries into my system by user ID, by computer name. I have my dates and my exits. And if we just wait just a second to prove something, we're almost there. Let's just wait till 26. Okay, so we've hit 26. Now we're going to close the database. If I relaunch it, let's go back into that table. You'll see that my 925 entry has, a, in fact, an exit at 926.04. So the entry, the exit, everything is working beautifully. The next thing we can do from an admin standpoint, just to simplify our lives, because who wants to work with one, two, three, is we can build a very simple query. And if you look at this query, you'll see here that I got usernames and I've linked it with an inner join to the user table. So I'm able to convert the one, two, three over to actual names. And lastly, I added in a uh, right here, a column field 
for the elapsed time. Just, it helps me inside and figure things out myself, right? So if we just view it, you'll see now I get a proper visual representation. And with this, I can run, you know, uh, filters, I can sort, I can do whatever I want. So as you can see here, you can see who's come and gone, different dates and times, and you can see how long they were in the system for. When I said before, it can help you identify people that are exiting the system improperly. This here is what I'm talking about. I can quickly come and identify that on three instances on the 14th. So it's unlikely that someone's still in it past a day. Oh, there are systems that run all the time, but it's highly unlikely. From my perspective, when I look at this and I see no exit, it means they killed the access process. Or if this was Citrix, they closed the session without closing the database first, things like that. And this can cause corruption. And when you see, you know, it, it happens once, it's not the end of the world. But when you're in situations where you see this frequently, and from the same user over and over and over, it permits you to identify them as, well, a risk. And this is when you take a couple minutes to sit down with them and politely just go over and ask them to show you maybe how they exit the system and just go over the proper way and try to explain to them that it really is very important and that you're, you know, you need them to comply and press the X button. They, you know, that's all it really is, or have a, a button on the ribbon or on your menu or whatever to close exit. If we were talking about, let's say today, I want to look at, I've got a problem. I need to close the system. Well, I could come here. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go back to the table for a second. We're going to jerry rig the data. So let's come here and let's just wipe this, wipe this. Um, and let's have some fun here. Let's make this the 15th as well. And we can say this is user two. This is user three. The computer names aren't important for what I'm trying to illustrate. But if we now rerun the query, we can now quickly come here and sort this by date. Okay. And we can clearly see that today, this is who's been in the system. This as of today. And we can see that this user, Daniel, entered and exited. So he's no longer in the system. But you can instantaneously tell that these two users went in the system at 9.02 and 9.25 and are currently in it. So if you need to ask users to exit because you want to do a compact and repair, you want to do an update, you want to do whatever, well, you know instantaneously I need to approach Joe and I need to approach Martin and ask them to close the database so I can do what I need to do. You're now fully in control with as simple as a table and a query. So that really is it, guys. This is what I wanted to illustrate. Um, there are other things you can look at, like I said in my article, and if you want, a uh, really good one to look at was this um, tool that was uh, developed. I've used it myself. I actually, it's hidden in most of my applications. It's always something that's good to have from Data Adrenaline. And um, so, you know, download it, take a peek at it, but it's punctual, okay? Versus the approach I'm showing you gives you the history and allows you a little bit more oversight over exactly who, when, where over time. And it also gives you the punctual, because like I say, I'm able to instantaneously identify who's in the system currently. And that's it. Uh, you customize this however you see fit. Like I said, all of this stuff, it's nothing's in stone here. So if you want to change the name of a field, well, then you just come back in here and update the name. You know, you want to call it OS computer name, call it OS computer. You want to change this to DB login, change it to DB login in the table and then here in the VBA. There's only th these two functions that need to be updated. And then you obviously update your table, your uh, form if you want, your query. It, it depends what you're doing. But it's just standard updating stuff, no, no big uh, surprises. And you're not going to break anything by uh, renaming tables or fields. And like I said, you use the auto exec to open this guy, but hidden. So it's running in the background. The user just doesn't know it, but you're achieving your goal. 
Okay, we'll stop there. It's been uh, long enough for something that's relatively simple. And that's it, guys. This is what I actually apply in all of my databases uh, because it works so well. So um, thank you for watching. Um, you know, as usual, like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and have a great day. We will see you in the next video, which will be with this very same database, but looking at another user tracking aspect. Take care.